I also believe that this is a fantasy. I mean, VCs need this stuff, but I'll explain why. What we now know is for strategy is what the mistake we made is not remembering that planning needs to go before the plan. That is, the business plan and the revenue model and income statement balance sheet and cash flow are what you do in existing companies if you're a product manager launching the second, third, and fifth product. Because what do we know? We know where the customers are, we have a sales force, we have a company, we have all these things, and therefore putting together a plan, an operating plan and financials, makes all the sense in the world. But in a startup, we're dealing with a series of unknowns. And so I've now become a big believer in the business model canvas as their first step in planning. Um, and if you haven't read it, uh, trust me, I don't get any commissions, but I make everybody buy uh, Osterwalder's business model generation book. If you don't want to spend the money, you could download the first 72 pages for free as a PDF. Does everybody have this book? Yeah, right, good. So uh, as a given, when I have a conversation with anybody, student, entrepreneur, etc., I'm talking about the canvas. I'll be talking about their value prop, tell me about the customer segment, tell me about product market fit, tell me about all that stuff, and I'm referencing this. Now, what's neat about the canvas is that Oscar Walder and I have now become peanut butter and jelly because, you know, when he drew the canvas, it was a great 2D planning document. And I realized and convinced him that there was a z-axis behind it. That is, customer development was the process that you actually test all those nice little yellow stickies that he has you put on the wall. We'll talk about that in a second. So I believe that the first thing you do is you sketch out, even when you have the first idea, the first idea. I had my idea about 1099s. I have my secret idea that I'm not going to tell anybody. It's so good. The first thing you need to do is you need to have hypotheses about all nine of these boxes. You got an idea? The next thing you do is not tell me how great it is, tell me your hypotheses about all of these boxes. Now, hypotheses, as we'll see later on, is a fancy phrase I use at Stanford because those students pay $50,000 each. Outside of Stanford, they're called guesses. In fact, I call them effing guesses, and I'll let you guess what the effing stands for. Uh, but you really, anytime you say, I have an idea, immediately, if you're going to be anywhere near me, I want to understand, how does your idea flesh out? And it doesn't have to be 43 pages, just tell me the little yellow, yellow stickies. Here's who my customers are, here's who my channel is, I'm going to have partners or not, etc. And so therefore, the business model hypotheses come way before you ever do an operating plan and financial model. So it's not what we don't, don't want to do plans, it's not that we're not going to do financials, it's kind of silly though to do them before we actually have tested some of the underlying hypotheses. Makes sense? Done. Okay. The second thing we used to believe is you know, for process, we built startups by managing process. You know, we did product management, we did waterfall engineering, we did something that looked like this. Anybody recognize this diagram, right? Concept seed, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. I grew up with this stuff. You drew this in front of a board member, they handed you a check. Okay? And you hired the marketing people over here, and they worked on the launch, and the sales team worked, you know, was hired here, and biz dev got hired. I still don't know what they do. Uh, and then engineering was doing waterfall. You hired a QA and a tech pubs department, and, you know, boom, you kind of knew what you were doing. We now know that this diagram is also a leading cause of death for startups. Why? Because implicit in this was this. You've been following the process, you understand waterfall has two implicit, implicit fatal errors. Waterfall says, I can spec the entire product from day one, not because I'm a genius, but because I'm telepathic. I understand completely the entire customer problem on day one. And because I understand the customer problem on day one, I and product management could sit down with engineering, or I, the engineer, can now spec every possible feature necessary for a first customer ship. I don't need to talk to anybody. I just know this. That's why waterfall stinks. Not because it takes long, not because it burns a ton of cash, not because it wastes a ton of time and money, which it does for all these things, but it assumes telepathy. And if one of you thinks that that's your skill set, boy, you should be in a different business. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made somewhere else. 
but waterfall just kind of fails as a management tool as well. And so what we really now know is that most startups fail from a lack of customers than from a failure of product development. I see this now, and I kind of go, why, of course. But I didn't believe this at all. When I first started thinking about customer development, I went around to my VC friends tentatively asking, is this possible? And they looked at me like the dog was talking. And I said, Steve, depending on the industry, over 95% of failures for technology companies are because of, because of a lack of customers. Most startups, with all due respect, are engineering problems, not research problems, biotech being the only example. So it's not like, how many of you are engineers? Okay. All right. Hopefully this side. Is there some person over here? Okay. Uh, it's not like, hear this clearly, none of you ever deliver on time, right? but almost all of you manage to deliver. That's not what sinks your company. What sinks over 95% of startups is we really didn't quite understand our customers and markets and product market fit. Yet we have a ton of processes historically to manage the engineering schedule, but we have no processes to manage the customers. And so that process was what customer development was about. Discovery, validation, creation, and company building. And we'll talk about this some more. But this was a invention to add a process on the stuff we actually fail on. And so the new process, customer and agile development, goes before you get to manage a product. Does this make sense? So there's now a front end. What we used to believe is org charts. Here's the, I did this for 30 years. Large companies have VPs of sales and VP of marketing and biz dev. First thing I was going to hire was a head of sales and marketing and biz dev. Why? Because my VC said, where's your head of sales and marketing and biz dev? No one ever said, well, wait a minute. Maybe I really don't need, on day one, a functional organization that looks like this. <laughs> I was always hoping I'd have one of these. Eventually I did, and you know, you needed one of those you are here charts. Um, what we really now know is for organization on day one, the founder and founding team is not in sales or marketing or biz dev. They're on the customer development team. They're answering the set of questions that we just don't simply know about the business model. Who are the customers? What's the revenue model? What's the right channel? that is going through the entire canvas. Sales, marketing, and biz dev are execution functions. You hire them after you've done the search. Does this make sense so far? Right? Just kind of a refresher. And so this stuff, the search stuff, is what the startup owner's manual is about. It's about a series of details about what you do. And I'll go through some stuff. And then eventually, you get to do all the stuff that the Valley used to do. I get to hire you know, product management. I get to put together an operating plan. I get to have an org chart that my mother actually understands you know, my title and what I do. But you don't do that first. This is what screwed us up for 50 years, is confusing search with execution. So part two. Let me just give you a refresher on business models and customer development. And let me start with Steve's definition of a startup. How many of you ever heard this? All right, again, this half of the room, I'll talk to this half of the room. So to me, a startup's a temporary organization. This was a real insight. Because I used to think, startups, cool, get to bring the dog, free food, you know, we're tight, it's a small group. Until I realized there's no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There's a 2-year-old startup attached to an 8-year-old failure. Because the goal of a startup is not to be a startup. What's the goal of a startup? What's the goal of a startup? Yeah, to be a company, not a startup. So this is temporary. Even though you're having a great time and there's bonding and there's you know cohesion, you've got to grow up. Because if you're still eight people in five years, you might be having fun, but you fail. And so a startup is a temporary organization designed to search. But well, wait a minute, I thought a startup was supposed to code or get customers or whatever. What the heck is this search stuff? What's supposed to search for something that's repeatable and scalable. Repeatable means if I put a dollar in, I get at least a dollar out every time. Right? It's consistent. Scalable means I put a dollar in and I get two dollars or five dollars out. But repeatable and scalable what? Repeatable
people and scalable business models. As founders of a company, your job is not to build a product. Your job is not just to find customers. Your job is not just to find the right person. Your job is to find all of those. All of those. And all of those, we now have a good definition of what all the pieces are you're supposed to search for. It's the business model. And again, as I said, Oscar Walter's book is as good as any. Just so you understand, now that I'm an academic, I can honestly tell you, if you get three academics in a room, you get 15 definitions of what a business model is. I love his stuff because it's all pictures. Right? Even I could understand. It's pictures. You know, you don't have to read a lot of words, unlike the four steps where you had to ask whether what language it was written in, and you got to make up your own sentences because I sometimes didn't finish any. But Oscar Walter's book was great. He said, look, a business model has these nine boxes. And sometimes he used, you know, fancy names like value proposition. That's like, what problem are you solving? Or what need are you solving? And what are you building to do that? What product or service are you building? That's the fancy word of value prop. This is where your product goes. But specifically, you got to tell me not only the features, tell me what problem or need. And then the next thing you got to tell me is, and who are you building it for? Not just, I'm building it for end users. Trust me, I got one of those in my first the student presentation. No, no, no. Who are they? Women, 18 to 32, live in the Midwest, want to solve this problem. Here are their titles. Men, you know, teenagers who want to be entertained with video. That is, I need to know eventually the detailed archetype of each one of your segments. And more importantly, what job do they want you to do for them? I used to think the only reason you had customers is they would write you a check. Right? That's, yeah, customers, I get it, they pay for the product. Not really. If that's all you believe, you're going to be like sitting by yourself or with three people for the next 10 years. You need to understand what problem, why did they care about what you're building? Third thing is, what's the distribution channel? How are you going to get the product from you to them? The web, kind of easy, right? Oh, I'm going to put it on the web. Some channels are more complicated even if they are web and mobile. Oh, i got to go through the you know, Apple Store or the Android Store. Or, gee, it's a multi-step web distribution. Or it's a physical product. I need to figure out how to get it to Best Buy or Walmart. You need to figure out your channel. Then you need to figure out customer relationships. And this is where Oscar Walder uh, used, I think, too complicated a word for a very simple idea. Customer relationships. How do you get, keep, and grow customers? Get, keep, and grow. How do I get them? How do you get them on the web? Well, getting customers on the web is act of, uh, uh, acquisition and activation, the whole set of techniques. Getting customers in a physical channel involves awareness, interest, consideration, purchase. It's the traditional sales funnel. How you keep them, their loyalty programs, how you grow them, upsell, cross-sell, etc. That's what customer relationships. And then finally, on this side of the campus, what's the revenue stream? And by revenue stream, it's not, oh, my price is $9.99. That's a pricing tactic. But what's the revenue model? Is it direct sales? Is it a subscription? Is there a freemium model? Even more interesting, is it a multi-sided market? That is, are there users who use the product for free, but there are payers? Right, everybody know Google search, multi-sided market, right? Correct? How much do you pay for use Google to do a search? Zero. What product do you use? What's the value product? What product do you use when you do search? Yeah, what is it? What product? The search bar. Great. And your revenue pricing is zero. Yeah? And the customer segment for search is who? Who? Excuse me? No, the customer segment just for search, for users of search. Who is it? Everybody, right? The whole world. Great. But search is the most profitable business in the world. How does Google make money? How do they do it? How does Google make money? From two. So the, the value prop is ads, right? Who's the customer segment? Sorry? Ah, ads, advertisers might buy ads. Great. Who are they? I'm sorry? B2B business, yeah, who else? <coughs> Small businesses, who else? 
anybody selling something? Anybody selling something? Great. So wait a minute. Um, number of users for search. Not advertising. Let's go back to users. How many are there? How many users? About hundreds of millions, right? Facebook, 800 million customers. So maybe Google, maybe half of that. I don't know. We're saying. How many advertisers are there? 800 million. How many advertisers? How many payers are there in the Google business model campaign? Take a guess. Yeah, maybe 100,000. Maybe. I'm sure they'd love it to be a million. And I bet you it's not 100 to 1. I'm sure it's closer to 1,000 to 1. What's their revenue model? For the advertisers. I'm sorry? Say it loud. Pay per click. Kind of interesting. Key idea. Multi-sided market. Each side has a different value prop. There are different customer segments, certainly different revenue streams, and you may have different channels of customer relationships. So, for example, Google has direct sales force, as well as the self-service pay-per-click. Does this make sense at all? By the way, the trick about Google's uh, model is, uh, for some of you might know, they copied it from Overture. And you thought, oh, it was invented by Overture. But if you really think about the user-payer model, who was the first people to come up with this? Anybody know? Any idea? Newspaper? Say it again. Newspaper? Yes. What year? 1857? Pretty close. 1834, but not bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys were joking and guessing. You have no idea that I made it up, too. Thank <laughs> 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 you both do that. Um, <laughs> because I'm standing up here. <laughs> uh, but the point is, newspapers did it, right? And then radio did it, right? You had bunch of listeners, and then you had a bunch of advertisers. Then TV copied it again. And then the web, users, payers, oh, I get it. New, we've been doing this for 150 years. My point is, and I just wanted to talk about multi-sided markets for a second. Anybody doing medical devices? Anybody at all? Great. Okay, what are you making? Um, actually, I'm, I'm working with my own idea. Okay, so let's, let's assume you were making an artificial hip. Can we assume that for a second? Okay, great. Or anyway, know a relative who had an artificial hip or artificial something? Great. Who was the customer? Who was the customer? The doctor. The doctor was the customer. The doctor put the customer inside their own hip. <laughs> how about how about the patient? What are they? Was it who's you? Sorry. They were elderly. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, all right. Well, wait a minute. There are patients. There are doctors. Okay. Any other signs? Insurance, insurance, insurance companies. Insurance companies. Who else? And these days, the customer himself. I mean, the user himself. The user, right? The patient, the doctor, the insurance company. Who else? Hospital. Hospital, right? You can't just go into any hospital unless there's probably some approved, you know, list. Who else? Veterinarian. Sorry. Who else? It's a veterinarian. Veterinarians. Now, I don't think on this one, uh, <laughs> unless you're getting them really cheap at wholesale. Uh, but uh, regulatory. Agencies, right? You just can't implant anything in the U.S. There's the FDA. Uh, so, in some markets, the only reason I use this example is multi-sided markets could have five or six sides, and you need to understand all the pieces because any one of them can make it not a business. Make sense? And in fact, in the U.S., doing medical devices, regulatory stuff is actually adds millions and tens of millions and years to the process. And so, uh, by the way, all this kind of Pulls out to the business model canvas. I make everybody kind of put this up on the wall, put up your yellow stickies, but realize that they're just hypotheses. And while you can put up these yellow stickies, at the end of the day, um, it's a fun exercise and great, but they're truly just guesses. Just guesses. And that's where we turn hypotheses into facts. I love the canvas. So the first time I saw it, my, my question was, so now what do you do? Mm. And the answer was, well, you move the stickies around some more. And I said, Alexander, I, I think I have something that could help you. We could take the guesses into facts uh, by searching outside the building. And the four steps is the startup path for turning customer, business model hypotheses into facts. And so customer discovery and customer validation is a formal process for just taking the business model hypotheses and very rapidly turning them into facts. 
And we do this by testing the problem and then testing the solution. We start a canvas, we get outside the building, we run a series of experiments. So we have our hypotheses, we design some experiments, we run some tests, and hopefully we get some insight. They either confirm or change our hypotheses with iterations and pivots, and we update our canvas. Um, I think you all know about the MVP. MVP says instead of waterfall, we're going to use some type of agile process to build our product iteratively and incrementally. Um, the pivot, Eric Reese, I think, did the world a favor. They used to have this loop, which was unnamed, between validation and discovery, and Eric nailed it. He said, Steve, that's the pivot. And I think that was uh, probably the best invention. It's when your hypotheses don't match reality. You're doing validation or you're doing discovery, and all of a sudden you're learning that your hypotheses on that canvas are just not true. In the old days, and this is a big idea, in the old days, how we solved this problem is we fired somebody. It's a huge idea. When the plan didn't match reality, the VP of sales got fired. And when it still didn't match reality, we called it a marketing problem and fired the marketeer. Then eventually we fired the CEO and then we shut down the company. If you really think about what we're doing here, it's a huge concept. We're firing the plan first. That is, we're changing the business model to match what we're finding. Now, ultimately, we might need to fire, fire you. In fact, we might need to fire all of you. But the first thing we're assuming is, okay, startups go from failure to failure. That your initial ideas are more than likely, in fact, the safest bet I'll make is your initial idea is almost certainly wrong. And this is really hard for smart people. I got this idea, it's I'm gonna protect it, no one could see it because I'm a genius, and if somebody copies it, I'm out of business. Somebody mentioned Facebook and the you know the two brothers, what were their names? Winkler Floss. Winkler Floss? Winkler Floss brothers. Do you know why they failed? They didn't fail because Zuckerberg stole their idea. If anybody believes that, you should leave now because there's nothing you can learn here. They failed because they failed to execute like son of a bitches. Zuckerberg took the idea and ran as fast as he could, and unlike the movie, got a million things wrong, but he was iterating constantly. He was a machine for learning. These guys had an idea and thought that was a company. Every one of you in this room should understand your idea is not a company. My dog has ideas. They don't raise money. Somehow people think my idea is like, this is it. All I need to do is execute my idea and like, we're done. The odds are your idea is wrong. And the whole game of entrepreneurship is how quickly do you learn which part of it is wrong. And by using a canvas, we could break down your idea to customers, to the value prop, to the channel. The odds of you getting that all right on day one is zero. Entrepreneurship for any computer science people. How many any computer science people? Great, because I'm going to say something, you're going to have to explain it to the rest of them. Entrepreneurship is an NP complete problem. Computationally unsolved. But using the canvas turns it into an NP problem. That is, it's very hard, but now solvable. NP complete means there's an infinite set of choices. NP says we've kind of bounded the problem. Does this make sense? And we'll talk more about this in Q&A. Um, so search versus execution. First step in customer development is customer discovery. Um, the new startup owner's manual recognized one major thing. Web businesses and businesses in physical channels run at different speeds. Web and mobile startups run much faster. They use different detailed steps. And the customer relationships, while the funnel looks the same, the activities are just radically different. But so in the new uh, startup owner's manual, the path goes in parallel. Okay. We're about 35 minutes in. So okay, it's we're almost done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so web mobile is on the bottom. Physical channels are on the top. 
the first thing you do is you write down all your hypotheses. And the book tells you how to do that, how to get, understand you know, who's your channel, what's the market type, um, how do you get keep and grow customers, etc. Step two is you get out of the building and you test the problem. How you test a problem on the web is you build something called a low fidelity minimum viable product. How you test the problem with a physical product is you build a cardboard model or something tactile and you go outside. In both cases, you're not selling something. You, when you start your company, have an implicit assumption that everybody has the problem or need that you have in your head. Your first step is to see if other people agree with you. This is a huge idea. The odds are you don't have a vision. The odds are all of you are hallucinating. That's a joke, but some of you are now laughing because maybe you've just discovered it. Okay? We want you to hear from other people that they share your vision of what the problem is. And then we let you go out again once you integrate all that data. And now you're allowed to talk about your solution. Not about your data sheet, not about your features, but now you're allowed to go out and say, so what if I could do it this way? And what you're waiting to hear is someone to grab you across the table by your collar and say, you can't leave until you tell me more, because I'll empty my wallet for you. Instead, most of the time you get, nah, that's a stupid idea. And it's crushing. But because you're an entrepreneur, you'll ask a series of questions to find out, well, I thought I understood the problem. Tell me why this solution doesn't solve it for you. And then, in discovery, you pivot or proceed. And let's say you get people acknowledging that your solution is a great idea. Not your details of your product, but the general concept. You then go into customer validation and you get ready to sell and then you try to sell to early evangelists, other crazy people. And it's done by the founders. These first orders are brought in by the founders. And you take everything you learned trying to test sell, you develop positioning, and then you pivot or proceed. And hopefully by validation you have early orders which have proven that there's some segment of people who will pay real money for your product. Does this make sense so far? Great. So, um, Robbie, do we have time for an example, or should we do the, uh, what, what it's, it's, you your, it's your call. We have, um, we have about, um, do it, if, it, if you can do it in, in two, can you do it in two minutes? No. So let's just end here, um, and then okay. we'll do Q&A. We'll do Q&A. And all then right. I'll just come back to the end. Yeah, Great. Okay. So did any of this make any sense at all? Yeah. Okay. Good. Do we need two chairs, or one, or? Well, can I ask, can I do some moderate community of you and then we'll open up to the audience? Okay. Is that good? Yeah, great. Because we have those questions here okay. to make it. Can I get to pick which ones I answer first? <laughs> no, I get to leave Steve playing to Steve play. Okay. Or do you want, well, Steve, actually, if there are questions you want to hit first, go for it. Yeah, let me do the kimono disclo disclosure thing, because um, it's a great question. It's a, it's a fair question. And um, so I'll give you the extremes. If you're doing something in life sciences or biotech, don't leave your living room without a patent counsel. I mean, don't even leave your bedroom. In fact, don't even talk in your sleep. Um, you know, you might be leaving a billion dollars on the floor. If you're doing a web something, with all due respect, it's an engineering problem, and while you might want patents later, you know, worrying about that on day one is not your biggest problem. You can convince yourself it's your biggest problem, but your biggest problem truly is getting rapid customer feedback on day one. This whole how much do I keep this secret versus how much do I share is, is traditionally drives particularly engineers crazy who don't understand that your first idea is more than likely wrong. It's a big concept. If you think your first idea is right and that all you need to do is find somebody to give you a check so you could open up a factory, uh, then you shouldn't be sitting in this class because nothing anybody could tell you here is going to be useful. And I don't mean that there aren't corner cases where that's true. I'm just saying about 98% of what we do in this valley, the trade-off between not telling anybody versus getting some feedback early on is, is, is just incredibly way toward getting feedback. And I'll use the extreme. I now teach business model design and customer development for the National Science Foundation. This year we're going to teach 200 
of the top science and engineering research teams in the United States. Next year, 400. Year after that, 1,000. They are doing the most advanced technology in the world. And they are doing customer development. They are getting out, and an average team talks to 100 customers in eight weeks. Now, what they don't say is, and here's our IP, and here's all our proprietary patent stuff, and here's all, there's, when people hear customer development, somehow they think you have to tell somebody all the details of what you're doing. You're just not understanding the process. Because you shouldn't be talking. Most of it is you listening and getting other people to talk. Does that answer the question? That makes a, yeah. lot, a, a complete sense. I'll I don't see. know who asked the question. Did, 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 you, did I give you an answer? Or was... Yeah, and I just wanted to talk about what you said about the Facebook solution. And I mean, it's different because I'm an engineer, so I'm not an expert in the product. But if I go to Facebook. Right, so you, you don't have a company yet. Exactly. No, no, so I just exactly. want you to hear that again. You don't have a company. All right, you have an idea. So until you have a partner, uh, you actually have no clue what you have is valuable or not. Okay. okay. So. Oh, sorry. I'm just um, trying to get the mics coordinated. This might be out there to me for, okay. for the speakers and they have questions. So uh, sure for I, I just want to point out that you are going to drive yourself crazy <laughs> until you have a co-founder who can actually give you some balance here. But you are just going to run. There's nothing I'm going to say or anybody else that will make you sleep better at night until you have a partner you trust. And that's what I'm trying to I understand, but, but, it, but you sounded like you were going about it in a different way. What you should say is, I need to find a co-founder. Okay. Uh, pick another. That's a great question. Okay, okay. Uh, let me start off with the questions that we had before. We can also okay. open it up later. We have about 40 minutes, so it'll be a good, we have, we have time. Do you want to sit or should we stand? Yeah. So you see, you're saying he's sort of obscure part of how it works. He said you don't have to talk about details. Of course, because so the, the question. Yes, so, so, so the question was, uh, yeah. can you? So the question was, uh, are you okay. saying, Steve? So Steve, it sounds like initially you were saying what you understand what you're really looking for, which is to find a co-founder. And then secondly, the question was, are you saying obscure the details well, of what you're doing? So remember, yeah. uh, and this is why I went through the customer discovery process. At least what I'm teaching is the first thing you're trying to understand is the customer's problem. Where does your engineering details come into that? And then the next thing I'm saying is, see if your general solution, not your features, not your data sheet, solve that problem. Where does your details come into that? And then the, finally I'm saying validation. Now you're gonna go out and sell something. Well great, if they say, I give you the check, but you gotta like tell me the details, guess what, that's called the sales process. That's eventually, you're gonna need to get there. So the whole customer discovery narrative has nothing to do with you saying, and here's my IP, and, and if you run into those customers, and, and you often do say, well, I can't do this until, you've not found what's called an early evangelist. You've found a regular customer who you write down their name and say, oh, they need all the details, I will get back to them in a year. I need to find the equivalent crazy people where the concept is so important that they're willing to kind of, you know, teach me something until they finally say, listen, you're asking three and a half million dollars. Can you at least tell me what color it is? Does that help? Okay. Yeah, that's great. I love this idea of what you say. And every time you say it, it sinks in my head of how quickly are you learning how you are wrong? Right. And just having that as a mentality. And I wanted to start from like the basic use case. Because in that business model canvas, of the nine boxes when you're starting out, the two most important ones are the value proposition and the customer segment. Okay. And that's what we call and, and you might have heard the term product market fit. Yeah. Now, now you can see a diagram of what product market fit is. It's that value problem. Just for a second. And that, and, and that, and that's the heart of I think the first question, which is this tension of what's more important: is it the value proposition or the customer segment? So when you're doing that, so the answer is yes. I know, but I want to tease. I want to double click on that or push into that. A little so bit you further. start with the value. So when, let me ask. And, and let me pose the. Uh, let, let me pose the. I'll the answer any question I want. And you can actually make them up too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the customer. <laughs> These yeah. are the customers. Um, and so the, the, this dilemma, and I think it's a classic one, is there's this mantra of finding a tight, tight fit. Um, and you can find that tight fit within a very small customer segment market. And then there's a mantra from the VCs, which is go after big, go after big markets, even if the fit isn't as strong. Which, when you're going after that initial dance between the value proposition and the customer segment, which is more important? Is it the fit or is it the size of the lucrative of the Right, so the thing that Canvas doesn't show is the size of the opportunity. That is, assume that the business model canvas, those nine boxes, are floating in a bigger universe. And the bigger universe is 
are we doing a canvas for, at the end of the day, a $2 million a year of business or a $200 million a year of business? And a good number of those questions I heard earlier might have been because some of you haven't act, kind of assessed the opportunity. That is, opportunity assessment says, so let's say we got it all right. Like, how much are we selling in year five? And if the answer is, oh, Steve, we have a great $5 million a year business. I'm going to like start, start taking a couple steps back. Because you've de decided you are not a scalable startup. You've decided you're a small business. Nothing wrong with that, but we should have had that conversation up front. And can I just riff on this first? Yeah. It turns out that one of the things that used to confuse me tremendously is I'd come up with these great ideas and like I couldn't even get meetings with PC. Until I understood, I didn't know what their business model is. That is, unless you understand what the business model of angel investors and venture capitalists are, you're going to have a very frustrating career as an entrepreneur. You need to know why and what they fund. And sometimes you hear about these you know, throwaway lines, we look for billion dollar markets and we look for X, and you don't quite understand, why are they saying this stuff? And, and I won't do it here, and Robbie, because this used to be his job, yes. go through all the math, but basically, unless they can make an obscene amount of money on you, they don't have enough hours in their lifetime to invest in you. They will not invest in companies that will look them in the eye and say, it's a great $20 million a year business in your mind. And, and there's some number. Yeah, but, but, and, 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 I, and I totally agree with yeah. that. And, but, but then, practically, when you're actually starting out, do you get product market fit with billion dollar yeah, market? So, yeah. So, so let, let yeah. me keep going. The, okay. the first question all of you need to ask is, do you care? That is, well, I don't care. I still think it's good business. The one thing you need to understand is, if your business isn't large enough in the eyes of an investor, you are not getting VC money. And that might be okay. You might say, well, I'm doing a web startup. All I need is a couple hundred grand. Okay, then understand that that's the business you're in. Or you might realize, well, I love this business that's going to be $5 million a year, and I want to do it. Well, congratulations. You're now a small business. And small businesses don't raise risk capital. You need to get your funding from other sources. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's how most businesses start and are run in the United States. Over 50% of people in the U.S. work for small businesses. They don't work for the government. They don't work for large corporations. They run restaurants, database consultants, and small software companies. They just don't raise risk capital. So the universe that your canvas needs to be in is, am I a scalable startup, meaning I'm going to be billions? Am I a viable startup? I'm doing a web or mobile app that might be acquired, and I could get started with a couple hundred grand, and that's all I'm going to need? Or am I kind of confused about where I fit? Is that that's the first piece of this? Yes, I have a question. OK. <laughs> and, and if there's a second piece, you can not answer my question and go to the second piece, too. I agree with everything that you said about the, this idea of understanding fit. Yeah. I mean, and there's this other element of fit besides the customer's yes. product. It's you, the entrepreneur, yes. and your financier. Yes. But having said that, every entrepreneur who succeeded, and I imagine you're in the same boat, yeah. never under, never projected their market size right. They never, they never knew how big the opportunity was if they succeeded. Uh, and you know, even Mark Zuckerberg, when he was starting famous, there's this famous example that he was starting another business on the side. He, and this is to your point about being relentlessly execution focused because he was freaked out that Facebook would take off. Um, and even for more traditional businesses, when you're beginning, your initial customers are even a diff are a bit of a different flavor than the customers that are going to come on your year four or your five. And so I think there's this constant tension when you're starting out where even if you can get the product market fit, you know, if you isolate the customer demographic narrower enough, you'll find strong fit. And uh, that might be wider in some of the bigger markets, but there's always that first vertical. And then there's a question of, what, of whether or not that is something that you should invest in or just give up on. Well, so you have a different question of whether you should invest your time in versus whether somebody would invest their money in. That's true. Right. So the way that's, so so yeah. let me that's so true. you could decide that you are going and building a first product, but your business is actually a series of products and a series of customer segments that kind of layer on top of each other over time. But and I'll use the 1099 example. And and I, I'm not don't mean to pick on you because you were brave. Uh, but if you told me, well that's a great five million dollar business now my real question I'm dying to ask is, 
Are you happy with that, or do you want to build a bigger company? And, and if you want to bigger, build a bigger company, then you need to show me a series of business models that said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm going to use that to get the foot in the door here, and once I'm in, I'm going to eat these guys out from the bottom, because once I have that relationship, it, at least you have a strategy for building something bigger. Or you could say, no, I love this stuff, and I don't care how big it is, I'm just going to do it because I love it, and make it a million dollars a year, and that is make me happy, make my family happy. Great, we've declared that you're a small business entrepreneur and only in Silicon Valley is that a majority. Everywhere else, no, everywhere else you kind of get high five. That's a lot of money. What are we thinking? Does this make sense? Does that answer your question or not? It does, but do you really believe that, Steve? So, like, when, yes, you're, starting, I do. when you're starting out a company, and yes. they're, 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 I do you know, now. I never did when I was not. Yeah, because and, I think when we first talked, there was also the dilemma of how do you apply customer development to the venture back companies right. like Twitter or right. Facebook. So I think and, the problem in trying to use any process, like customer development and agile and anything, um, to look at black swans, yeah, is it, just a mistake. Because then you'll say, screw any process, it, it'll just happen, and we don't need to do that. But, so let me just yeah. be clear, because yeah. I think you just raised a good point. Yeah. Using Agile and customer development and this whole lean stuff and everything you're teaching, yeah. uh, it's not going to make you Facebook and Twitter. The only thing I will guarantee that this entire process, I now know this is a fact, U.S. government certified now, is we will make you fail less. Big idea. Over a portfolio, a lot of you will not go out of business because we will stop you from doing the hundred stupid things that entrepreneurs do. You will get to get more swings at the bat or, or kicks at the goal. That's what following these processes do. And it will put you and force you to be in front of more people, paying attention to more possible opportunities. It definitely will not make you a Facebook or a Twitter or Steve Jobs. Is that? Sorry if it won't, but it, 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 it's not. It, but you will still be in business a year later. Yeah, you're mitigating kind of, your downside risk. That, yes. Yeah, I get that. Right. And so, so let's let's go into that because you know in that process where you do find a product market fit, and this is a question that was raised, are there any predictors of a use case that is a predictor of a big company? Like, sure. is there a moment yeah, that absolutely. Case I had where it. you can say I'm done. I had it at Fifty. Yeah. I had it at Nips. I had it a couple places, and the, when I didn't have it, I ignored it and like created the company. And how did you know when you hit the use case, which was like, uh -huh. was it literally somebody? Yeah. When, when the, actually, the, the one in Epiphany was where a guy who had been working at Pricewaterhouse for 17 years grabbed the pen out of my hand, walked up to the whiteboard and finished my diagram for, for me, and kept drawing more stuff than I like, ever figured out, and then said, I want a job. And, the, and what I realized, and I kept learning, and this was just a corporate B2B sale, but it works in other places, it works in video games, it works in, in, in social media, is that if you haven't found anybody who actually has this need and this passion, it doesn't get better over time. It's not like let's ship more or write more code. It's you don't you haven't connected to that problem or need. And you will find that, that there are people out there who get your insight. You're not the first here. You're the first person to have this insight. You're in a new market, my friend, and that's five to seven years. What you're hoping for is you're in an existing or an adjacent market where someone will say, I've been thinking about this too, but I never had the guts to, you know, put my children's trust fund up for sale and, you know, mortgage my house for the third time. And you're insane, but I've had this idea too. That's exactly what's happening. So it you. comes from the cut. So you know you've nailed it when a customer is. When a customer, customer is crazy, crazy as you without your personal risk profile. And, and again, it could have been in video games where someone's saying, Wait a minute, that's the first level? Wait a minute, you can't leave. I want the rest of the game. Or, you know, wait a minute. And then you go, well, will you pay me now for it? Yeah, here's 40 bucks here. Take my money. Can I be first? You can't find any of those people. Yeah. It doesn't get better. And then do you care about competition? I mean, does it really matter <coughs> to worry about competition? I used to use competition to steal the best ideas, but only because I was executing a lot faster. I mean, I did why the Zuckerberg thing kind of relates to me is, you know, I won't say I was Zuckerberg, but I know that meme is that I took anybody's good idea and I was just like, I was just Smart. relentless. No, I was relentless. If that's an idea and you're not moving on it 24-7, I'll go, damn, we're wet. You know, I was, so it's not just strategy. I was the most anal retentive, you know, executor on a tactical level you've ever seen. <coughs> you didn't want to be in my way. And so you had these competitive matrices. You were you were paranoid about thinking about the, the, the competition. No, you, no, no. Did you, it were wasn't. you using like an internal so, so here's the way to think about competition. It's like driving by looking in the rear view mirror. Right? I mean, you can't worry about what, and by competition, I mean other startups. 
oh, they got more press, oh, they got more. If the total available market is so small that another startup could take it all in the first year, you're both in the wrong business. And there are some segments that are just like that. Now, usually, you're just kind of like egging each other on, and there's some great ideas, but you need to be focused on customers and markets and business and not worry about who has more press and TechCrunch and whatever. In fact, I give them all the press. I, in fact, when IMBU started, um, you know, Eric and uh, Will Harvey were, oh, look at Second Life, look at all the press they were going on. going, thank God they're like, creating the market for us. Yeah, well, if I, oh, we need to hire PR people. I said, no, 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 they need to hire all the PR people. <laughs> and they were, they were doing all the PR and look at all the hype. I said, we need to focus on users. And oh, no, look at all their announcements and all their fun. I said, keep this up. And you know what? They, yeah. They, yeah. They're the last man standing. I mean, you, you know, who knows what will happen to the company. But of all that noise, I just get, in fact, when, uh, I'm not sure Eric tells this story, but uh, uh, Eric Reese uh, was my student at Berkeley, and I made uh, Eric and Will take uh, my class before I funded them. And uh, they came into the class, I'd say, uh, probably the second or third week, excited as heck. Uh, oh, we just spoke to the reporter at Wired. It's her first story is right. And I ripped them a new orifice. I mean, they couldn't sit down with, why are you mad? I said, guys, the company's six months old. And back then, they were an AOL 3D add up. <laughs> and I said, do you think this is where your positioning's going to be in another six months? We're still changing strategy daily. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to get this. Oh, people are going to come to our site and they'll use our product. I said, I said let's set our watch here. And, you know, great. Next day after the story, I think some number like 875 people on this big wired story. Right? You know how many people actually were able to download the product? <laughs> like nine. And like it crashed five of their machines. And, yeah, I don't know how I got into this, but it was it, to, to well, me. I, yeah, yeah. It, the, there is always this worry that you're like, jinxing companies. I always feel when you get pressed too early. But, but I think the temptation for entrepreneurs, the question is, it's marketing. So when you're starting yeah. out, the, the, the press, Brings eyeballs, it brings attention. No, you know, how do you do marketing? That, that's a, so now we're into a question no one asked, but I'll answer it anyway. No, no, it was a, it was a right. question. So, so think of the press as kind of like an ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile. Once it's launched, it's impossible to call back. And when it lands, it could have devastating impact. Um, and, and sometimes for no good. So when you think about press, oh, gee, you got nothing better to be on TechCrunch on day one. Now, you need to back off and say, why do we want press? And half the time, it's kind of the unspoken, so my friends and parents can know I'm doing well. You know what? And you, no, no, seriously. And so I make young founders, because I've been there, because that's why I want them half the time, just say that. Just tell me you want your mother to see your name in print somewhere, and so we can just put that in one bucket. The other buckets are, no, 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 I want it for demand creation. Steve, remember that get, keep, and grow? I need some acquisition. Great, let's put that in another bucket. And then third is, I'm always raising money, so I need the investors to kind of see that I'm real and, what, and they read that stuff, and how else are they going to know about it? Now, besides those three things, I can't think of it, maybe partners. Partners could be partners are part of your business strategy. So now we could write them down, right? I, you know, my ego, which is, we should at least acknowledge it, uh, customer acquisition, <coughs> financing partners. And then we should balance that with Wired is not going to write another story on you, not until you succeed. You're not going to get another TechCrunch story. <clears throat> Maybe, you know, if you set yourself on fire somewhere or do something with animals or children, I don't want to know about, but, <clears throat> but the odds are fairly low. So therefore, you ought to be sure that everything you're doing matches one of those columns and is the right timing to go do that. Does that make sense? It does. And so then the question is, <coughs> on, the, on the, 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 the customer marketing piece, on the mm -hmm. customer input piece, how do you do bootstrap marketing? And the question that was raised, I think, was especially on the B2B side, right. when, you're a when you're a strap startup. Right. So the, the assumption is, well, I'm right on day one, and I want all those CIOs in B2B to know about me on day one. And therefore, you know, there's nothing better than getting on TechCrunch, because I believe every CIO in the world reads TechCrunch. That means you just don't know anything about CIO, uh, or you don't know anything about B2B, because if you actually did some customer discovery, you would actually find out what conferences they go to, what blogs they read, who are their key influencers. Maybe you ought to be in the Gartner Magic, Magic Quad Quadrant before you do anything else. Or maybe there's some way to figure out what their air supply was. It could be an epiphany story. Yeah. 
50 story is I discovered that there were two audiences in a corporate B2B sale I needed to get, operating execs and CIOs. The biggest name at the time for operating execs, because there was a trend of the year, just like there is now, was a guy named Don Peppers and his partner Martha Rogers. They wrote a book called One to One Market. I managed to figure out how to cut a business deal with their firm. I gave them a quarter of a percent to my company, and I followed Don Peppers on stage in every large conference he gave a speech at. And he was filling up auditoriums of 1,500 people. The last 15 minutes of his speech was me. The next audience I needed to get were CIOs. Back in the late 90s, the two magazines that mattered were CIO Magazine and Computer World. I gave a quarter percent of my company uh, to Joe Levy, who was the publisher of CIO and Computer World. And I was the only enterprise software company invited to their exclusive conferences to meet the top 100 CIOs in the United States. And so without- How did you get into those guys initially? Well, I, once, no, but I, I never knew about enterprise, I've never seen enterprise software in my life. But as I started doing customer discovery, I was asking CIOs and IT people, so what do you read? Who's the most credible source? What do you guys follow? Who, who if they told you to buy X? Oh, Computer World and, you know, say, not Gartner? Nah, Gartner, it's pay for play. You know, we really, like, read the articles. Really? You know, and uh, it cost me less than, like, to pay off Gartner to pay off Joe Lee. And pay off is the wrong word, but implicitly, I called it an air supply strategy. What were the two chess pieces I needed to move? And by the way, I had exclusives. None of my competitors could do this right? for three years. That was That's the deal. Uh, and by the way, that quarter percent was worth $16 million to each one of those companies. There you go. Just for, just for scale. Joe Levy had the world's best watch collection. He collected a lot more watches after he was done with the 50s IPO. That was his personal IPO, yeah. too, right? That's great. And so that's, that's, I think that, was, that's, that's, that makes sense. That and makes and sense. each one of you, this is not, you should know this on day one. You should be embarrassed you don't know this after six months of your start because you haven't gotten out of the building enough and asked questions you've been trying to sell or you've been trying to code and build a product. This data is out there. You'd be surprised how much people will share this information for you. How did I get meetings? I made sure at least, again, I'm using a B2B example, but works out elsewhere. Hi, I'm X. I got your name from Y, who said you were the smartest person in this industry. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And do you have 10 minutes, and I promise you I don't want to sell you something. I'm trying to understand whether people have this kind of problem. Yeah. And I always called after 6 p.m. when their admins went home. So the odds are I could probably get somebody on the phone. And by the way, if I didn't have their phone number, um, it, you know, email and corporations, anybody ever notice? first name dot, last name, or first initial, last name, whatever. Yeah. There's only four variants. And if you send them to all of them, you have about a 95% hit rate of getting to the executive. And you'll always say, I met one of your board members at a party. I forget who. They gave me your name. Who <laughs> I can say that? You know, who? Oh, but I'm no longer in business. I guess I can say that works all the time. <laughs> really? They mentioned my name? Oh, you know, I don't remember. I don't know how I got Where did you get me with anybody? So then the question is, what are you going to do in that meeting? And if you're trying to sell something, you are really wasting the opportunity because you don't know anything yet. What you really want to do is learn that Canvas is a great map, and the Startup Owner's Manual will detail what is it you need to know. Does that? That's fantastic. What, okay, channels. So do you have a religious point of view on, on when it, you have the right to start to engage channels? Yeah, or? day one. Uh, uh, day one, but you need to pick one. So. See, now, when I was at BC, I was always averse to companies that were getting into channels early because in my mind, if you couldn't sell the product, it was just a Oh, oh I, didn't mean, I didn't mean you're selling through the channel. I mean you need to be talking to the channel. Oh, okay. So, so talking tell to... Me, so tell talk, when you talk to them and when do you turn them on? Well, so for example, let's say you have a product where you decide you're going to be selling through Amazon or you're selling through whatever. I want you to personally figure out how to sell it directly first. What are the features? What are the ads? Whatever. One of the things about an indirect channel is that they're a filter between you and end users. The good news is, you know, you might need them and they do have access to a customer base you don't have. The bad news is you're going to be one of thousands of products that they're going to carry. In fact, the, the most the saddest examples I remember investing in a startup who I happened to walk in the day there was champagne going on. Hey, you know, somebody's birthday, what's going on? We sold Walmart. Great. I mean, you know, like, how much did they sell through? Oh, no, no, no. Walmart just said they'll take our product. And i got to tell you, it was another Eric Reese moment where I got angry. I said, get the champagne out of the business, out of the building. 
Anybody have any idea why I was angry? They had just signed Walmart. Why was I mad? Besides being a jerk. Why was I mad? Any idea? It may not have matched the hypotheses or the entire No, model. assume it was right. Assume okay. Walmart was exactly the right channel. They hadn't, they hadn't sold anything. Exactly. Well, so, they, so assume a week later they get an order from Walmart. Why would I have still been angry? You're going to get lost. Yeah? Anybody know what return rights are? Yeah. Anybody ever hear this phrase? Yeah. It turns out in most channels, the channel has a 100% return right of your product. Plus, they make you pay the return shipping just to pour salt in the wound. If the stuff doesn't fly off their shelf, it's all coming back home. The only number you care about when you have an indirect channel is not the victory of signing them, which is immediately hard work. It's the sell-through. How much stuff is being sucked out their other end, or else you're thinking you're celebrating revenue where, you know, this is why companies used to go to jail, is they celebrate what's called sell into the channel. No, no, my friend, what you need to celebrate is sell through the channel. And you won't know this, this is back to Robbie's point, unless you've been selling and test selling yourself early on to see what it takes. Because again, channels are mostly a shelf. That is, an indirect channel is kind of like the grocery store shelf. They'll put it on there for you, but it's your job to get consumers to want to suck it up. This is it does. And so then the question is, when do you know that you know enough to, to engage channels? Because I always think that there's a tendency for startups to, to, to feel like, oh, I've got a channel. Right. They'll solve well, the sales right. problem. Um, so I was always paranoid. And, yeah. and, and, and just, you know, there's no right time until like you start seeing end user demand for the other end. Yeah. And, and you need to create that demand and your channel partner will always say, don't worry, this is how we do it. And, and then the other thing you find, oh, but we need some special incentive money to, you know, run the promotion. Oh, and then we need, oh, you want this on the aisle? Oh, yeah. you know, more money. And yes. Then you want to, and, and then you're like, your, your margins are negative. So right. uh, you just, this is why I want you to engage the channel on day one. So if you don't know anything about the, the channel you're in, you need to be talking to them and other people in the channel. I used to talk to competitors all the time. Um, you used to talk to competitors directly. Were you oh, yeah. your competitors? Did you invite uh, them? To, did you do, were you like one of those entrepreneurs that would? So there was a company I was with called Supermac way back in the year. Anybody remember this company? Way to your grandparents could tell you about it. Um, it was a Macintosh peripheral company. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I took over marketing of this uh, company called Supermac, came out in Chapter 11, it was fifth in a group of three. That's how screwed up we were. And uh, this company called Radius was 25 feet tall. And so I said, who the heck is the head of market? Um, and so I went ahead and had lunch with him. It turned out he was a nice guy. In fact, then I learned a ton of stuff of, you know, what was important to them, what was what we should be doing jointly, and so there were a couple things. And I also, just so you know, which is that I used to do this forever, I took his measure and said, I'm going to kick his rear from here to somewhere. Uh -huh. um, because you know what? I have, I just kind of always had this killer instinct and that I wanted to know who I was competing with. And I'll tell you guys a terrible secret is that um, this company, the company I, I joined was coming out of chapter 11. And anybody ever been in a company where sales and marketing were fighting with each other? Anybody ever been in, just two people, really? Uh, I decided to solve this problem for my marketing people because we were focused on, you know, screwing our own sales people and I, it's just crazy. So I got a, I asked for a photo of my competitive VP of marketing, and he sent me his PR press kit with this photo in it. I made a dartboard out of it. And you had to throw darts at it before you were allowed to have a meeting with me. And the entire company became focused on that's where we're going. And See, where does that come from, that killer instinct? Because that is something that I think is really the part of the essence of what makes great entrepreneurs great. And I don't know if it's a motivation. Well, what makes uh, great yeah. entrepreneurs yeah. great is strategy and killer you got to kill our instinct, but just be wasting it. you, you got to think strategically about who you're going to kill. You know, everybody talks about how you have to be passionate about whatever you go after. Well, that's passion. It's an, yeah, but there's different types of passion. There's sort of these um, aspirational passions, and then there's sort of like a more of a killer type of passion. Is there one type of passion that you think is better? Well, listen, I uh, you know, we're in Silicon Valley. In the 21 years I worked as an entrepreneur, I know in my entire 21 years, it was only three weeks where I didn't want to go to work. In fact, it was, you know, out of those 21 years, I was afraid that 
bosses would find out how much I loved doing what I was doing and make me pay to work there. And I would have, I mean, that's how much I loved doing what I was doing. And so the passion was curiosity. I, I went from uh, supercomputers to video games to military intelligence to enterprise software I did two semiconductor companies. My, my game in Silicon Valley was learning something I knew nothing about and getting very good at. Um, and so I had one level of passion of just, what a, what a place to, you know, what a, what a meritocracy. I mean, you know, anybody could do anything here. Um, but the second was, there is no number two. Um, yeah. at, at, least, at, at least for a startup, you know, with all due respect, if you want to be number two, you know, go to work for Microsoft. Um, sorry, if anybody here. <laughs> <laughs> they sponsor? I, mean, uh, no, that's uh, okay. <laughs> I said that when I was actually in Microsoft. They went, oh, we're in Microsoft. You are working for Microsoft. Um, whoever thought they'd be a footnote in an asterisk of computing history. Um, in, in, in any case, you need passion on multiple levels. Um, if you want to be a founder or a part of a founding team and you're not curious, um, go get a job somewhere else. And I mean curious just in a lot of stuff. And if you're not passionate, if it's a job to you because your friends are doing it and it's cool, go do something else. I mean, you know, this is like the most exciting thing that you could be doing. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of risk to it as well. Well, well just on passion, and we'll go back to the thread too. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs is like, Steve Jobs is one of the most passionate visionaries who was out there. He was, he was oftentimes quoted as saying that if I listened to what my customers wanted, um, I would have built the next iPhone. Or Henry Ford was famous for saying, if I had listened to what my customers wanted, I would have built a faster horse. Yeah. Right. Um, and you see a, a lot of what we've actually been even doing in the speaker series is this, these notions of when you're doing customer development interviews, how much of the insight actually comes from talking to people, and uh, how much of it actually comes from observe, observing people, and, and having insights where people don't even know what they want, and, and unearthing that. So first of all, those quotes are probably the, um, uh, I think uh, they've been spread by the Apple PR people and while well, made Steve look like the genius he deserved, did enormous damage to entrepreneurship because they weren't just, they were simply not true. Um, when Steve Jobs was well, um, you know, I lived a mile from the Apple store in Palo Alto, so did he. And I'd see him in the Apple computer store. Do you think Steve Jobs couldn't get a computer delivered to his house? Anyway. So what was this guy doing in the Apple store? What? Who is, when he was helping, did people remember he'd, in fact, answer one customer email a month? You'd hear, you know, somebody got an email from Steve. Anybody remember that? Right? And usually it was no or F you, you know. I mean, but it was, it was okay for Steve. Or, you know, hell no. Um, you think that was the only email he read that entire month? Right? Jobs was actually completely attuned to what was going on outside. He wasn't sitting in some lead lined room in a Zen Lotus position where light bulbs came on. Uh, but what he did do, him, Disney, Edward Land in the 20th century, probably had the best instinct for science and art than anybody else. So this is not to diss this guy's instinct. Yeah. But please don't get that he was sitting in a lead lined room with no customer feedback at all. And the types of comments he made, I think are really require you to think about market type. And market type is this thing where I say, are you in an existing market? Are there customers and are you building something better? Well, if there are, and the customers can name the market, and they could also tell you the basis of the competition, you not talking to them is critical. Right? Second market type, I want to take a segment of an existing market. I want to find either a niche with special needs, or I want to build a low cost entry and figure out what the uh, right feature set is. Again, not talking to an existing market and finding out their needs, criminal. Yep. But in a new market, where you've invented something that just doesn't exist before, one could easily say, oh, just stay in the building. It'll come full blown. And I'll just say that's equally criminal. Because here you're not asking people what they want, but you're observing, if I build this, what will it replace? What will people do differently? How do they do their job today? How do I know what will they be? And, and they won't tell you that, yeah. but it's your job to both get engaged and informed outside. And do you have a, a view on whether or not direct interviews are better for customer development versus observation studies? And there is a growing a school of thought that people actually don't really know what they want when you ask them. And we've had specific cases. So uh, I think, yeah. uh, uh, again, I want to separate that market type. So it depends on the market type. It, yeah. So in existing and resegmented, you know, I think it's pretty clear 
talking to people and engaging them any way you can. Yeah. You know, whether it's, will you use this, give me a check. I mean, my game was, you know, really, how much money do you have in your wallet? Yeah. Well, $90. Great, give it to me. Well, why? Well, you said you, you love the product. I'll take $90 now. <laughs> well, I don't love it that much. Okay. Well, I just found that. <laughs> by the way, the other pricing game I used to play, which is enterprise pricing, but you can play this in any game, is uh, if this is when you have a, an engaged prospect. You go, oh, this is so exciting, whatever. And I'd say, you know, like, how much would you pay? Oh, we would pay X. And they, well, whatever number it is, it's wrong. Because then I'd say is, okay, you know, if the product, was you told me you're excited, the product is a million dollars. And about half the time, people would go, a million dollars? Steve, we never pay more than 375, but 375, <laughs> I swear to God. And, and, uh, 375, thank you, okay, upper bound. And then you say, and when they go, no, no, you're really not your choice. And I say, no, no, imagine the product's free. Free, you really give it to them? No, let's just do the thought exercise, it's free. Now, imagine it's enterprise software for a second. Well, free, okay, how many would you take? Well, what do you mean? It's free. How many would you take? Take me through the process. Well, you know, yeah, I'd take one. Well, wait a minute. We were talking about 10,000 before. What happened? Well, I didn't mention, but IT needs to get involved. And, well, then, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, that's a six month about, well, you didn't mention that before. Well, wait a minute, who else needs to get involved? Well, I, forget to, I forgot to tell you, but the head of sales, they have a standards committee over, and then so free gets you a whole other conversation, right? So I go off to find out bounding boxes on pricing. And what you really want to find is, you know, what's the easiest way and what are the barriers? I'm sorry to get off on that. No, that was great. That was great. Okay, I know there's a, a couple quick questions and we're limited on time. Uh, let me just hit the other questions that I haven't hit right now. One is scaling. So after you find the product market fit, any views on how you scale? Do you scale by customer segment? Do you offer more products by customer segment? Do you take that product and offer it to different customer segments? Do you scale within locations, outside of locations? You know, hopefully you pick the segment that you know how it scales from day one, or else you wouldn't have picked the segment. The customer segment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and two is, this is why if you've done customer development right, you're raising money here with a killer story that says, here's what we thought, here's what we did, here's what we found, here's what we thought, here's what we did, and you have a chart that's starting to look like this, and users and whatever, and, and the logical conclusion for an investor could be, these guys have figured it out, and all we need to do is pour in money for execution. They de-risk the business. It's a beautiful gift you can give. Right. Them. You give it. You, it's like it's like an intelligence test. It's like okay, you know, this is a team that can learn. Look, they screwed it up on someone else's nickel, and this and the chart looks like this. What am I missing? Well, you're missing the other 700 things that could break. But that's when you go from search to execution. Yeah. Right. And that's so when you go, gee, Facebook started with a couple hundred grand. Why did they need a couple hundred million? It's that scale, right? And scale's not cheap. And then the other quick questions are on two sides of the, like, customer development 102 or 201, uh, two-sided marketplaces. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot of those developing there. Yeah. Are there, you know, if you do customer development for each of the parts of the two-sided yeah. marketplace, is there anything that you have to be very sensitive about? Well, the first thing you should be sensitive about is um, what are investors funding? So, for example, if you've got a Fred Wilson in New York, they'll fund, you know, scale on users and we'll figure out the payers later, right? And there are certainly a ton of VCs that kind of believe show up with, you know, 10 million users and, you know, we'll figure out a monetization strategy later while you're spending any time on payer. If that's not who you are, I would suggest you probably want to look at both sides of the market because there might be a, we could get people to pay from day one. Yeah, which I think it was just more of the steep link DNA, probably. The steep link DNA, just because you know, like I come I, from, I'm you know, usually rock, so I want somebody paying my bills now. To validate, them. right? To validate, like, or the classic is, oh, we'll do it in advertising. Really? Well, have you talked to any advertisers? Well, no. Do you know what the CPM is? No. Do you know? Well, then just say you don't know. And if you do know, tell me what the numbers are, and then you run them out. If you don't know, don't bullshit me with some, oh, it'll be an advertising model. Say, say we don't know what the monetization model is, and then decide whether you can get away with that with an investor or not. I tend to not let my students or things I invest in go that far. I yeah. say, if you're going to say it's advertising, at least run the exercise and talk to a bunch of people and tell me what, you know, what they're paying money for. Does it? That makes total sense. And, and so you know when you're right, because you have one of those moments where yeah. you have that emotional customer that yeah. has to you forward. How do you know when you're when it's time to give up. So and this really is a personal thing. Yeah. So um, my number was three and a half years. Just 
Three and a half years before getting the product market? No, three and a half years before I'll stick with a failure and then I do something. That was my career. That's, so there is no right answer. You know, there, is a, uh, there was a guy who was a co-founder of MIPS, a guy named John Sorts, great stories, because it's not me, uh, who when the, uh, he did a follow-on company because he got thrown out of MIPS and screwed by you know, the investors, he said, I'm never going to have that happen again. I forget the name of the second company. Did, raised a ton of money, built a fab in Silicon Valley, you know, right at the peak of one of these semiconductor bubbles, must have raised $50 million. He was just wrong. But he patented everything. And basically, you know, all his investors pulled out, and he managed to buy back the company for like, you know, $1.25, and kept at it for 12 years. Like, you know, eight of them by himself and his girlfriend and a dog. I mean, that was it. And, you know, we used to call him the Flying Dutchman of Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, 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 strapped to the mast, you know. Just, and then one year, this is why I'm kind of, I was, happened to be reading the Intel Annual Report. Don't ask me why, but it's a favorite reading thing of mine. And I saw a footnote, a charge against earnings. 500, oh, the name of the company was MicroUnit. Uh, charge against earnings of $565 million in a patent settlement to MicroUnit. <laughs> John Mazzaris, after 12 years, made $565 million and owned the entire company. <laughs> the Flying Dutchman now owned the cruise line. <laughs> That's what I so, so, yeah. but, uh, but I say, tell you that, and I've mean, got to be honest, Robbie, I would have walked away after three and a half years. I, have a I had a different career model which said, you know what, this valley's great, I have lots of ideas, I've worked with lots of smart people, you know, other people might stick it out for 10, you know, unless they got a memo that says there are multiple lives after this one, I want to enjoy this one by doing other things. And so there is no right answer. It's just when you're doing those whatever years you have, you can't do it half-assed. If you got the impression from me, you should, that this is a full contact, full body sport, and if you're not willing to engage 24-7, if you guys want to read something, any of you have families or relationships or want to have them, no, obviously raise your hand. Okay. Uh, there's a... Uh, blog post I wrote called Epitaph for an Entrepreneur. You should all read it. It's how I kept married and raised two kids doing eight startups. Um, and, and, and did it giving, but giving it 200%. I mean, startups are 24-7, but if you want families, you need to figure out how to do it within that context. Um, and this is, it's not that we got it right, it's just how we did it. It turned out, you know, our kids still love to come home now that they're in college with us since we did something right. It's amazing. Yeah, it's it is really, amazing. It's amazing. And the other story I always hear about is FedEx, which weighs the Series H, which is a recap before right. they took off. Uh, we have a few minutes. We have about six minutes left with Steve. What's the best question? Why don't you think of best question? Yeah, let's get the best question. Oh man, right. no one had the best question, really? What's the second best question? The second best question, Who's going to ask? What's any question? All right. This is the third best question? I hope so, first of all. My question is the following. So basically, when I'm observing most of success stories in, in, in high tech, so at least half of them do not fully fit into your uh, uh, process. So the reason is that very often, if people develop some MVP and go to customers and yeah. uh, hear that's a complete crap, so they may have something else. I mean, they may have the same product uh, interesting for some other customer groups, or they may have, have something hidden in the organization which can be sold. I mean, perfect example being PayPal, for example, who started from BDAs and ended up in entering pay, uh, payment, uh, pay, payment or, or Flickr, which was originally a game company and ended up as, as uh, Butterfairy. So, how do you apply your method in finding, say, different applications of your product, which might be totally unexpected from from earlier assumptions? Yeah. So, so let me uh, answer a generic question, which you didn't ask, and then answer yours specifically. Um, one of the first things you should always ask when somebody's up front in a stage is, are they trying to sell me something? And, and, or are they trying to offer you some generic advice? Uh, so the good news is I no longer sell stuff. Uh, I have some opinions, uh, but customer development is as lean, and hopefully Eric would tell you the same thing, and lean startups is not the method. And if anybody's telling you it's the method, they're lying to you. It's a method. It's a big distinction. It's a method. So a method in an industry where we never had a method, where the best method was go write a business plan. 
Now all of a sudden, I'm proposing there's a methodology. You don't like this methodology? Come up with your own methodology or go do whatever else you're going to do anyway. There's no like thought police here that says you do this or this. Um, but now back to, and I just want to make that clear that, you know, does this cover every possible case? Of course not. You know, and there are other times where I think it's much better that for the entrepreneur's personality, put the book down and go do what you want to go do. Uh, so you can make a corner case that, oh no, this didn't fit in X or Y. I will contend that if we really look at what uh, the examples you used, they were actually doing a good part of their me this method by getting out of the building and figuring this out. They just weren't drawing the diagrams and running the process. Uh, there were smart people who actually were doing this instinctively. Right? This didn't come from whole cloth. This came from what people were doing for best track practices for the last 50 years. So that would be my answer, is A, it's not the method, it's a method, and B, if you deconstruct a good number of these stories where you don't think they were doing any of this, it turns out except for the black swans, they probably were. Next, whoever. So you think your method assumes um, sort of a psychological nuance that engineers yes. they, they don't have? Yeah, no, so it, it assumes a psychological nuance that engineers are reluctant to have. But I teach engineers, and in fact, I teach some of the best engineers in the country, both at Stanford and the National Science Foundation. And watching the transformation is uh, is why I teach, um, both for me and for them. I can teach anybody who wants to do this how to do this. Um, but it's hard, and it's harder, you know, my because that was my background. My joke used to be the difference between an introvert an extrovert for an engineer is whether they stare at their shoes or your shoes. Um, and, and I've now figured out how to teach them how to make eye contact in eight weeks. And that's pretty amazing, right? Where your default is, oh no, I know the answer, more code. You know, that, that, another question, more code. You know, let's add another feature, you know, more code. And, and I'll tell you, we can get you to do this. It's not the default though. Your personality, and I don't mean yours, but in general mind was, I remember the first time like, I moved into marketing and I had to make a sales call or even a phone. I thought if I stared at the phone long enough, it would dial itself. I still remember, and then I still remember actually getting a customer to agree to have a meeting. I was high fiving around people, thought I closed a million dollar deal. I said, no, no, no I got a meeting. <laughs> I went, okay, is this your job? Um, and can I ask a follow up question on that, which was raised earlier, which is how involved? to the organization be a customer development? Do the engineers do customer development? That's a great question. And, really how, great and question. how much, many of them do they do it? So we discovered this at Epiphany. I had a great partner, an insane co-founder named Ben Webright, who was a genius. Um, and I decided that one of the things I wanted to do when we were running the company um, was not only have the weekly meeting, you know, everybody had the weekly, you know, beer meeting on Friday, blah, 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 but I wanted to tell engineering about every failure we had uh, outside of the field. And I said, Ben, can they take it? And he said, if they can't, they shouldn't be in a start. Good for him. And so we would, you know, we'd tell stories and the wins and blah, blah, blah. But we talked about the losses. And what emerged the first couple of times was there was always an engineer in the back of the room who said, well, I would have thrown you out too. That was the stupidest thing they ever tell a customer. And the first time I heard that, like, rah, 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 you know, I'm the president. How could he? And then I, luckily, you know, I'd been doing this long enough that I realized, you know, so I said, tell me more. And he said, well, you should have told him X. And when everybody else saw it, he wasn't getting beaten up. And I was going, really, let's go try that. And, you know, someone else, you know, volunteered. And it wasn't that every engineer volunteered, but there was a couple that actually got quite engaged. The one guy who said that was Craig Weissman, who became the CTO of Salesforce. And the other guy who engaged was George John, who's now the CEO of Rocket Fuel. Um, and, and they actually uh, ended up uh, in sales because we grabbed them and said, these guys actually were great engineers. In fact, uh, Craig was the architect of our uh, uh, data warehouse. But and when a startup is starting out, when it's, let's say it's five people or, or six people and there's two or three engineers, yeah. would you, do you recommend that the engineers go on the customer development uh, interviews? Um, as much as they will do. Uh, so at minimum, the VP of engineering is part of the customer development process. And it's but as part of the customer development process is a direct interface with the customers or just yeah, so, part so of the for example, the, you know, the joke is I knew this would happen. Um, version 1.0 got shipped. Uh, we didn't hire tech support. Engineering had to support the product. Boy, version 2.0 came out and the marketing never had to ask for anything. These guys were supporting, you know, eating their dog food. Yeah. And Ben said, that's a great idea. Now, you know, I reinvented what other people had done a million times. But we had, we had engineers up and down talking to customers. Uh, because, you know, I'll give you the canonical story of what happened um, with the VP of engineering. 
uh, we had a potential customer in Schwab, and they kept asking me for this feature all the time. And, and it was called householding. And if you do database marketing, it's like a no-brainer. Of course, you need householding. But since we had never been in this business and make, we're making it up, I kept going, really? You really need this? Finally, the VP of database marketing for title says, Steve, bring your co-founder and I'll you know, put my engineers on it. OK, we'll talk. And so Ben went out with me. And this was our deal booth. I'll talk to customers anytime I want this to. But I first had to kind of like see if it was worth his time. And he goes into the meeting with their engineers. And they you know, draw their architectural needs. And Ben asks about five or six questions and nods. And we nod. And that was it. So we get back in the car from San Francisco. Our office is in Mountain View. And we pass the airport. Ben isn't saying it. You know, we pass Redwood City. And Ben isn't saying it. <laughs> and we get to Palo Alto. And I've known this is the third company I'm doing with Ben. And he's playing chicken with me. So I know what's going on. We get to Palo Alto. And finally, I give up. I said, Ben, what are we going to do about Schwab? And he says, what about Schwab? I said, what about Schwab? We just spent the afternoon there. You know, what are we going to do about their you know, the householding problem? He said, why? Well, Show them page six of the spec. He said, show them page six. Then our spec only has five pages. And he said, not anymore. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the customer development process, basically, you know, the MVP just changed right then. Because there was no question about, is there know, a need? There, it wasn't like marketing was asking some feature. You know, the guy was architecting the product. Just the, yeah. Obviously. And so they should be as involved even from day one on, on uh, inter, integral part of it. Okay. So the customer development team is not just the marketing the and sales for it, it, it's, 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 it's cross functional. It's cross functional. Okay. There was one right. yes. <laughs> oh yeah. So is it a mistake to try to straddle the fence on the focus and the bigger market? You know, you kind of mentioned like you know, maybe starting off with this market and this one. Um, so we have like a small electric vehicle that could be used for recreation and also for community. And you know, the same person could buy it for both. Um, but like we were wanting to kickstart it and we're not sure, you know, should we portray it as something that could be used for both markets or should we just kind of pick one and just really zone in on that? So straddling, and again, there isn't a right answer here, but I'm gonna give you mine. Mm -hmm. Straddling means I really don't know what to do, right? It's kind of a cop out because you don't know where to put all your energy. And if you were General Motors and you have infinite resources, you could straddle. The problem is, as a startup, you've got to make a decision. Uh, is that where are you going to succeed? And if you do succeed, is it a place where you want to know, like, uh, is that the win? Because remember, uh, you know, the bad news and the good news is in this room, it's probably one of you that's going to be worth 50 million bucks five or 10 years. Look around. Look around. One of you, 50 million dollars. The bad news is, for the rest of you, you probably would have been better off working at Walmart. That's the odd. Now, that's not the funny part, though. The funny part is, those of you who are world class entrepreneurs, we're feeling sorry for the other son of bitches in the room, because you're the one who's going to make the thing. <laughs> so, if that wasn't you, you, know, you should get out of this business. So, no, sorry. So, the, the answer for you is, you know, let's say you decide to focus on the easiest market. All right, you just spent seven years with the car business. Did you want to own that market, or did you want to bet the farm on trying to get into a bigger market? You don't have enough resources to do all, particularly because you picked a, a pretty tough business. Uh, I tend to kind of push the chips in when I understood enough to bet. Does this make sense or not? And, and by the way, it's an opinion. Uh, mine is, you guys ought to remember you're not in an existing company. You are betting everything every day. And so the game is, do I have enough data to now push the chips in? It's not, let me hoard them one at a time. When you hoard them one at a time, you're a rational individual running a small business. Big distinction. When you push the chips in, you're in a scalable startup, willing to bet it all to go out of business or win, and then do the next thing. And so you got to decide which one it is. That's great. Okay, on that we're going to end. Uh, oh, we have one more final yep. question. Actually, it was a uh, more of a comment, but I'll ask a question too. Steve, thanks uh, for coming to Citrix. By the way, um, we I just want to let you know our Citrix Startup Accelerator team, uh, Michael Harry is here, and Jeremiah in the back here, um, are partnering with the uh, the uh, 
series here to bring this education to everybody. And the question is, now that we're, a lot of the startup accelerators like us are promoting customer development and we're trying to push the entrepreneurs to be more scientific in their approach. What's your prediction for the future? Are we really going to have an impact on the startup, startup market going forward, do you think, in five years? Do you think the industry is going to be better at bringing some of these guys forward to be successful? So let me just tell you a, a, a short, very short story. So anybody ever know from history who the, what the first modern corporation was? Anybody know? Right, year 1600, East India Company, at least in the West. You know, Chinese had you know, things that looked like companies and Greeks and Romans, but modern corporations about 1600. And corporations evolved for about 300 years until 1908. The president of Harvard University goes, you know, we've learned a lot in 300 years, and America is turning from an a industrial, excuse me, an agrarian economy into industrial economy, but we don't have any trained managers. Why don't we put together a two-year advanced course called the Masters of Business Administration and take everything we've learned about strategy and uh, operations and HR and teach a trained cadre on how to execute and manage a corporation. And the timing couldn't have been better. The U.S. went from local to regional to national economies post-World War II. Was the, you know, 20th century was the American century for business. And the MBA and that management stack is what powered this country and the world. But I believe in the 21st century, jobs are going to be created by new ventures. And innovation and entrepreneurship is going to be as important as, as existing businesses were in the 20th century. But until the last three to five years, there were no entrepreneurship management tools. There were no books to read. All you could do is say, well, we're a small version of a large company, let's go read some big company textbook. What I've done, what Osterwalder has done, what Eric Ries has done, is starting to build an entrepreneurial management stack that's parallel. It's about the search for the business model rather than the execution. That parallels what you're learning as the MBA. And so I believe the future is, hopefully in five years, we'll be laughing at the Startup Owner's Manual because there will be competent people who actually wrote this stuff. But there'll be a stack of books and resources Right now, there's just a ton of blogs and their ideas and whatever. So to answer your question, I think we're just at the beginning of professionalizing what we do. And we still won't be able to, just like for large companies, you can't guarantee success, but you could train professionals who know what to do. I think that's where we're headed, because we're seeing the democratization of entrepreneurship that's spreading past Silicon Valley worldwide. So uh, thanks for the question. Let me end on a few things. First, I want to thank Citrix again. And there's fantastic, this is a fantastic facility, and there's fantastic uh, 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 food and drinks. And so please enjoy, please network. Um, secondly, Steve has his books. Um, and if you haven't gotten the Startup Owners Manual, you should. And I needed to get two volunteers, I nearly probably two guys, to help um, uh, bring some boxes of books in. And maybe, um, um, that maybe uh, you guys can go with um, Helen. Can you, can you escort them? And Steve, can I? take them to his car to get the books out. Um, Steve, Jin has a small gift for you over there. Um, so, so first of all, everybody can join me in thanking Steve. Um, <laughs> he chopped this. Uh, uh, and um, I want to uh, plug a few things, and you guys can all uh, hang out and talk. It was a great